Hello everyone, I'm Matthew Fishman. I'm an associate data scientist at the Flatiron Institute in New York at the Center for Computational Quantum Physics. I'm going to be talking about quantum computing with iTensor and FOSTA-Q. FOSTA-Q is a quantum computing library built in Julia that I work on with Giacomo Torlai, who is a quantum research scientist at the AWS Center for Quantum Computing. It's built on top of iTensor, which is a Julia library for tensor network calculations. So let me give a brief introduction to quantum computing. As we know, class computing involves sets of bits, which are states of zeros and ones. Our class computers act on these sets of bits using classical logical gates such as not, and, and or, and translate them into new sets of bits. And this is how our computers do all of their computations. Quantum computers extend this idea by using qubits, which are states of quantum systems. Qubits are like bits, except they're in superpositions of states of zero or one. Quantum computers act on these superpositions of qubits with unitary operators, which are built out of quantum logic gates, such as X, Y, Z, and C naught. And quantum computers map quantum states to other quantum states. And quantum computers have a variety of potential applications with the possibility of speeding up classical algorithms. For example, a famous algorithm for quantum computers is Shor's algorithm, which is an algorithm for exponentially speeding up the factorization of prime numbers, which has a, a potential application for breaking RSA encryption. There's other algorithms for quantum computers that have been proposed for speeding up search for doing quantum simulation of chemistry and materials and for doing optimization, machine learning, and linear algebra. However, there's many challenges that remain with building quantum computers. For example, quantum states are very fragile, so the noise from an environment can disturb the calculation. So they have to be run at very, very low temperatures. And ultimately, to make large-scale quantum computers, we need to use quantum error correction, but this has a high overhead of qubits. So for now, we want to use class computers to perform simulations and inform us on how to design quantum computers, help correct errors, and develop algorithms. So let's get a better idea for the complexity of simulating a quantum computer with class computers. So if we look at a state of one qubit, the qubit can be in a superposition of being zero or one. So it has a probability of being zero or one. This probability is encoded in a wave function, which has a length two, and in general would be a length two complex vector on our class computer. Two qubits have a, a state which could be either zero, 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 one, one, zero, or one, one which could be encoded classically as a length four complex vector. Three qubits similarly can be encoded in a length eight complex vector. And for n qubits, we need to, in general, encode it in a complex vector of size two to the n. So simulating a quantum system of qubits on a class computer in general takes exponential resources. Now, to make sense of this um, complexity, let's introduce tensor network diagrams. So a tensor network diagram represents tensors as nodes, and indices are modes of those tensors as edges. So for example, an order one tensor vector is a node with one edge. The matrix is a node with two edges. And an order three tensor is a node with three edges. And this can be a compact representation for a variety of familiar linear algebra operations. So for example, of, in a tensor network diagram, in order to um, 
represent a tensor contraction we connect two edges, which indicates that a sum will be involved in Einstein summation notation. So a vector inner product would be connecting the edges of two order one tensors. A matrix vector multiplication would be contracting an order two tensor with an order one tensor, and a matrix matrix multiplication would be contracting in two order two tensors. And we can represent more complicated operations like the trace of two matrices, the outer product of vectors, and more complicated tensor network diagrams, which we will encounter as we go along in this talk. So this, in, in this diagrammatic notation, the states of our qubits can be represented as these tensor network diagrams. So instead of exponentially large vectors, we're going to represent them as order n tensors, which have the same complexity for now, but just with a new notation. So let me introduce the, the way that we work with tensors with I tensor. So say that we were looking at a state of three qubits. In I tensor, what we would do is first define three indices, which will get assigned unique identifiers, which will be used for operations such as addition and contraction. So the equivalent um, operation for other libraries that use Einstein summation notation, such as tensor operations, Tulio or Ohm Einsum, first we would define the dimensions of our indices. So if we wanted to represent an order one tensor, in I tensor, we would just define our tensor with the appropriate index. Whereas with standard Julia arrays, we would just create a vector of length two. If we wanted to create an order two tensor, in I tensor, we would define our I tensor with two indices. Whereas with standard Julia arrays, we would make a matrix of size two by two, and so on. And Note that when we make these I tensors, the I tensors remember the unique identifiers of the indices so that they can be used in tensor contractions. So for example, if we were going to contract in I tensors A, tensors A and C over the index J, in I tensor, we just use the contract function, which has the alias star. So we can just do A star C, and A and C remembered that they both had the indices J and contract over the J index. Whereas, for example, we could use a library like tensor operations or Tulio to represent the same operation by giving labels to the Julia arrays. So we can represent other operations like outer products of two tensors, similar in I tensor with the same star operation. And with a library like tensor operations by um, giving labels to the Julia arrays. So as we get to more complicated operations, you can see that with I tensor, the fact that the, the I tensors remember the, the identifiers of the indices makes it easy to represent complicated operations like contractions and additions Whereas with a traditional Einsum based um, interface, you have to keep adding the labels over and over to the tensors because the labels are carried around with the tensors. So the advantages of the I tensor system is that you don't have to think about memory ordering, just which tensors you want to contract or add, and you don't need to keep rewriting the labels over and over, so it's less error prone. Now the disadvantages are that it's harder to contract, to change contraction patterns on the fly. So um, this this can be mitigated by planning ahead of time with the indices that you give your tensors. And also, I tensor may not be as flexible as libraries like Tulio, which um, can represent more general tensor operations. Um, So let's look at a more complicated example. So for example, if we want to take an SVD of uh, order three tensor over two modes, 
Um, in iTensor, we would just call the SVD function and specify which indices will go on the uTensor. But with Julia arrays, we need to first turn the C tensor into a matrix with permutations and reshapes, which as you can see, requires more code and is more error prone. So iTensor makes it easier to define tensor, tensor factorization factorization because the matrization happens internally. Um, this is, iTensor I has a similar design philosophy to Julia libraries like named ins, dimensional data, access arrays, et cetera, or the Python X array library in that it has labeled dimensions. However, the interface is different and it's more geared towards um, tensor operations and doing a lot of tensor contractions and additions. So let's look at an example of a simple tensor network. So say that we have an order four tensor, we can first SVD it between the first three indices and the last index, and then the first two indices and the rest of the indices, and then the first index. And so what we see here after doing this series of SVDs is that we've turned an order four tensor into a product of four order three tensors. So the, this is an example of a simple tensor network. And so we started with a tensor which had n indices of dimension D, so D to the n parameters. And we've ended up with a tensor network which has n times D m squared parameters, where m is the dimension, the internal dimension of the order three tensors that we've introduced. And this tensor network is referred to as a matrix product state or tensor train in the literature. And if this internal dimension m is much smaller than d to the n, for example, polynomial in n, then we get an exponential compression. Now, this doesn't always happen, but this um, exponential compression does happen quite a lot, for example, in a variety of application areas in physics, chemistry, machine learning, and quantum computing. And just to give a bit more context, this matrix product state is only one type of tensor network, and there's a lot of different tensor networks which can be used in a variety of different applications. And so you choose your tensor network based on your application. And this is similar to um, neural networks where you would choose a certain neural network depending on your, um, your problem. So let's quickly discuss how gradient um, calculations of tensor networks work. So say that we have a tensor network of four tensors A, B, C, and D. We can define a, a function of these four tensors, which is the result of contracting these four tensors. And so in iTensor, we would define, first define our indices and then define our tensors in our tensor network with the appropriate indices. And we simply use the star operator to contract the four tensors together. And so there's a simple result that the gradient of a tensor network or the derivative of a tensor network with respect to a tensor is just the tensor network with that tensor removed. So for example, the partial derivative of this tensor network with respect to A would be B times C times D. And so in I tensor, we've defined a set of chain rules for primitive operations like tensor contraction and addition. So using Zygo, we can easily take the gradients and check that it matches with our expected result. And so Let's see how this all applies to quantum computing. So if we have n qubits, a quantum computer will, as we said, perform a unitary operation on those qubits to create some general wave function, which is the state of our qubits. And so th this is the basis for every um, quantum computing algorithm. Now, a quantum computer can't necessarily 
um, directly implement a general unitary like this. So in general, this unitary gets broken down into a set of primitive quantum gates. So for example, here we're showing a quantum circuit written in terms of sickle cubic rotation gates and control knot gates. And if you were to do a full state simulation of this quantum process on a classic computer, in general, it would scale like D times two to the N, where D is the depth of the number of gates that are being applied and N are the number of qubits. And this is the kind of representation that is used in the standard um, yao.jl package, for example, and in a variety of other full state simulators that are available. Um, there's other more sophisticated algorithms for doing full state simulation, but they all ultimately scale exponentially in the number of qubits. And so the approach we take in pasta Q is approximating the circuit as a matrix product state, which is the tensor network we introduced earlier. And if you use an MPS simulation of a quantum circuit, the scaling is n times two to the d. So it scales linearly in the number of qubits, but then it scales exponentially in the depth of the circuit. So depending on your application, it may be better to use a matrix product state simulator like in pasta Q or a full state simulator like in Yo. And I did a, a quick simulation and checked that the crossover between the two is around 20 qubits, um, I think for depth 10. So um, this code on the right gives you an idea for the pasta Q interface. So you define a set of qubits, you define the quantum gates that you want to apply um, and turn those quantum gates into a circuit and then you run the circuit. And so with, for example, 50 qubits and a depth of 12, this simulation took about one minute, which would require a full state simulator, um, two to the 50, like two to the 50 vector to represent the entire wave function, which would be nine petabytes of data. So um, you can see that for cases where you wanna simulate a, a lot of qubits, but for a relatively short depth, um, you might want to use a matrix product state simulator. And note that there's an experimental package interfacing Yao with pasta Q called Yao pasta Q .jl, um, which would allow pasta Q to be used as a backend for Yao. And so let's let's look at a, a more sophisticated example. So. A common thing that you might want to do is prepare a certain wave function on a quantum computer, which would be uh, used as a starting state for a certain calculations. So for example, say that you wanted to, um, to study the dynamics of a quantum system, you usually need to start with a certain quantum state to start time evolving. So say that the quantum state that we want to prepare on a quantum computer is this wave function psi on n qubits. And so in I tensor and pasta Q, we would define our um, indices. So say here, we're gonna use 40 qubits and we're going to define some wave function that we would like to prepare. In this case, it's the ground state of a simple um, quantum many body system. And so, we're going to start with some circuit, which is built out of um, rotation gates, single qubit rotation gates and control knot gates. And we're going to take the angles of these gates as parameters of our optimization. So we're going to take this circuit U of theta which we define here in the code on the right. 
and we're going to define a cost function where we apply the circuit to um, a zero state and try to maximize the overlap of the circuit with the wave function we want to prepare. So after the optimization, when we find the optimal gate angles, this quantum circuit will be one that we can implement on our quantum computer, which will prepare the wave function that we're interested in. So this would be the um, cost function on the right, um, defined in pasta Q. And so in order to do this optimization, we use a variety of Julia packages such as OptumKit, chain rules, and zygote. And so we use chain rules and zygote to take the gradient of this cost, cost function with respect to the gate angles. And we use OptumKit to do gradient optimization, making use of those gradients. So that's shown on the bottom right in these four short lines of code. And so the Zygo takes the gradient through approximating the, this quantum circuit as a matrix product state and then taking the overlap of that matrix product state with the wave function. So there's a complicated set of operations, but that's all handled internally using chain rules and Zygo. And so um, for those familiar, this is very similar to a neural network optimization. And just like with neural networks, um, in order to do uh, variational quantum algorithms like this, we make use of the same types of tools like automatic differentiation and GPUs. And so the idea would be that we could create a variety of different cost functions to optimize for things like um, low energy or um, maximal or minimal eigenvectors of some um, some exponentially large Hermitian operator. So to summarize, iTensor provides a unique memory independent interface for tensor operations such as tensor contraction and decomposition. And Pasta Q builds off of iTensor to provide a convenient high level interface for analyzing and simulating quantum processes with many qubits. Um, you, some things I didn't mention in the talk are that you can run these same circuit simulations on GPUs built on CUDA.jl and QTensor, and this makes use of the iTensor GPU.jl package built by Katie Hyatt. Um, it's easy to define custom circuits and gates. Um, perform noisy circuit simulations and optimizations to simulate the interaction of your quantum computer with a noisy environment. Um, we have experimental support for tools like optimal control, um, doing open system dynamics, doing quantum state and process tomography where you get measurements from a quantum computer, and then you try to recreate the state of the quantum computer on your classic computer. Um, another feature that is um, nice to use is block sparse tensors, which allow you to make use of conserved quantities. And some future directions that we would like to go in are using more general tensor networks beyond matrix product states. For example, true tensor networks and PEPs, which could allow for simulating quantum states with more entanglement or different circuit geometries, and also implementing general tensor network contraction and optimization beyond matrix product states. Um, we would like to introduce more tools for parallelization both multi-thread and distributed, which is in progress. And we would like to start applying these tools to exciting application areas, such as quantum chemistry and error correction. So I want to thank you for your time. Um, please take a look at iTensor and PostaQ and reach out if you have any questions. Thanks.